Welcome, everybody. I'm Kyle Hines, and I'll be hosting the Players Podcast, a GTM family production in partnership with the EuroLeague Players Association. I will be having in-depth conversations with current and former EuroLeague players about important topics that many athletes face on and off the basketball court. Stay tuned for more episodes. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to a very special edition of the Players Podcast presented to you by the EuroLeague Players Association. Today, we have a very special guest. Um, man, he's a, a living legend, um, a future Hall of Famer. Um, and we can, you know, list his accolades. We could do a show just talking about his accolades and, you know, all the things that he's accomplished um, on the court. Um, you know, Olympian, uh, you know, all nba or all EuroLeague, all world. I mean, we can go on and on and on. But I'm very honored today to, you know, to talk to, um, somebody I admire, somebody I've been watching, somebody I respect for a very long time, um, and, and finally had this year had the privilege to play against. Uh, uh, you know, he he lit us up a couple times. <laughs> um, you know, my guy, uh, Luis Scola. Luis, how's everything? Hi, Kyle. Thank you very much for your kind words. I'm very happy to be here with you. They say this is a very nice podcast, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you, man. I'm I'm very honored to to have you as a guest. Um, you know, so. The first question I have for you, um, you know, what is the secret to like, your longevity? Um, you know, you're you're 41 years young. Um, you're still playing, still playing at a high level. Like like I said, this year I got to witness it. You know, defending you. I think we played four or five times this season. Um, you know, what what is the secret? I, you know, I think it's no secret. I think everybody knows the things that make you play longer. This is a problem. Is like they're hard to do and they're not fun. Yeah. Um, and they require consistency. And that is the thing, you know, it's not about like, we don't know what these people, what this guy, what these people, what these persons are doing. We know exactly what they're doing. We know what works. We know what doesn't. Uh, the problem is that those things are not fun. You know, they're, they're things that usually people don't, don't do. And, and not only that, like they, they're very unfair. Like those things are like, you do them for a long, long time. And then uh, the long, the older you get, one day you cheat or one day you don't do them. And then it, <laughs> it make you pay a price. Like it's like, yeah. I've been eating salad for a whole month <laughs> and I went out one day and for a whole week, I can barely get out of bed. Yeah. You know, it's a like very unfair. When you're younger, you get away with all those things. You just do them and nothing happens. And then to get to get, you know, to the late 30s, to get to the 40s, like those things punish you a lot more. So um I just don't believe it's a secret. I, I believe everybody knows it's just like mm-hmm. they're, they're not fun and they're and they're hard to do. Uh, you said like it, things are not fun and you know things are hard to do. For you, who is somebody who, you know, accomplished a lot, you know, had a long EuroLeague career, long NBA career, long international career, you know, what keeps you motivated? Um, you know, what wakes you, you know, like you said, what gets you out of the bed every morning, you know, wanting to continue to play basketball? Because, I mean, clearly, you, you don't have to, you know, but, you know, what what motivates you? Well, you know, as, as I was telling you, like, all those things, you know, like getting up early, going to bed early, like sleeping, training, all the things you do before practice, the way you eat, all those things, the preparation for the game, they're not fun. But at the same time, playing is fun to me, yeah. at least. Playing is a lot of fun, you know, to be able to compete, to be able to train, to be able to push yourself, you know, get a challenge, trying to accomplish it. Uh, do different things around the world, get get the chance to leave all the, I mean, like, you can very well talk about this, you know, the fact that you're living here and there and then now in China and Italy and then in Canada and the United States and Spain, knowing all those people, knowing all those places, knowing all those languages, those things are fun, you know, competing, playing, winning, losing, even when you do bad, you know, even yeah. when things don't go well, to me, Overall, the whole package is a lot of fun, and I'm enjoying it. But at the same time, I like play well. You know, I don't yeah. think it's fun just just to be on the court. I want to be able to do it in a way that I feel comfortable, that a way that I'm that I'm happy with it. And you know, for now, I am accomplishing that, and that's what keeps me playing. I feel like when when I'm not able to do that anymore, and then I won't do it anymore. But all the all the the, the things that you had to do to keep playing at this age. To me, 
are worthy in terms of like the fact of me playing or me being in an Olympic or the EuroLeague last year or the Italian League this year, all those things make it up. So this is what it moves me. Is there, has there ever been a moment, you know, in the, the, I guess, past couple of years, have you thought like, you know, maybe this is it, maybe you had a bad game or maybe you woke up in the morning and you're just like, ah, I don't know if I, if I have it in, you know, have it anymore. Has it, has it been something or a time where you thought like, you know, this is, I'm ready. It, uh, there, there were there were many times, you know, like uh, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Why I'm doing this anymore? Um, and and I remember at one point, like as you get older, like those questions come to your head a lot more yeah. often, all the time. And 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 sometimes I feel, and this is like something a little bit broader, you know, like a little bit bigger, uh, like a like a little bit bigger subject, but. Sometimes I feel like we lose proportion, like it's out of proportion. Like you play a bad game and you're thinking like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And then one day it, this was happening to me, right? I was playing. I'm like, what I'm doing? I can barely run. I, I play awful. Like yeah. what am I doing? And my wife came to me and, and she was like, Luis, you were in Houston. You were 27. You were averaging 18 points a game, and you were saying the same things. Yeah. Like you always play bad. Like yeah. the thing is, like you know, those things happen. Like those peaks and valleys, they happen all the time. But when you're older, you assign those valleys to the fact that you are old. But you were having those bad weeks before too. Obviously, they happen more often, but. I felt like sometimes like we always blame it on the age, the age, you know, it's like, okay, you playing bad. Every time you play bad, you cannot <laughs> play. And I was doing that to myself. And, you know, there was a lot of those times, but I, I, I felt it was for me like a mental process that I had to mm-hmm. go through and I had to accept that it was going to be times that I was going to be playing bad. And that was going to be times that I was not going to be able to run the way I like it. But uh, overall, I had to be comfortable with the result, with the overall result. Not with one game, not with one week, but the overall result. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also think that it's not so much us sometimes, like the older guys in our head. I think it's sometimes the outside that kind of like retired you before you even ready. Um, they look at you like you'll make a basket and they'll be like, oh, he's a that's a vintage move from this player or a vintage move from that player. If you have a bad game, they be like, oh, it's because of your age or those type of things. And like, I'll, I'm starting <laughs> to kind of experience it now. But like, I, I can say that like, you know, um, you know, mo- having motivation from you and like, you know, seeing guys like Chris Paul or like older guys, like, you know, that have success. Um, I like to say, man, like you guys have definitely been a motivation for me because you know, there's some days I wake up, I'm like, man, I had a bad game today, man. Is it because I'm old or is it because, you know, so I think that's definitely cool. Like, I, I was like, actually going to bro. I was, I was actually going to brought you up. Like yeah. this is to me started at mid thirties, you know, yeah. and they did not play like seven more years. Yeah. And, I, and I did yeah. a bunch of things in those seven years. So yeah. at that point I was, I was ready for retirement. And yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm still here. I'm about to play an Olympic. So yeah. I think like this is a mental process. You got to go, you know, you got to figure it out. Like, okay, we got to separate the noise and put everything on the table. Are you good to play? Are you in a good level? Are you in a place that you feel comfortable? And if the answer is yes, that's fine. But you have to be able to remove the noise. The noise is going to be yeah. and it gets louder as the years yeah. go by. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. I feel like the first question everybody asking me is like, so how many more years you got left? Or how many more years do you like you want to play? Or what are you going to do when basketball's over? And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm still playing. So. I can only imagine it. <laughs> why, why are we talking about this? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Now, now after, and I, I, I feel silly even ask this question because I just said it. But after twenty five years of of playing basketball, um, how many more years do you want to play? And this is not my question, but it's a question. Like I said, a lot of people just want to know how many years, how many more years do you feel yourself playing? Or are you just kind of just taking it day by day and kind of seeing what happens? I definitely take it day by day. I to, to answer your question very quick is I, I don't think I will play anymore. I think I will stop yeah. right after the Olympics. That's that's what I told the team. That's what I told myself. This is it. I, I'm not saying like officially I am retired because first I I don't like that approach. You know, like kind of like that goodbye thing. I just want to play the, the same way I play all the other tournaments. Mm-hmm. And then when it's done, it's done. Uh, because that, that goes with my personality. It's not like I'm creating some type of like suspense or anything like that. But 
Um, to to answer a little bit more elaborated, I I've been going day by day since yeah. pretty much Toronto. When I was in Indiana, I played I played a good year. I was we were winning, and and I felt that and that was the last year that I was completely sure that I was going to play. The mm-hmm. options on the table they were good. I didn't hesitate that I were going to have some good positions to play and this and that. So I ended up going to Toronto. It was good. Uh, I started there. We played conference final. It was fun. Mm-hmm. After that, things changed. The things that I had on the table, they were not like a clear cut I had to take. It was yeah. not a completely sure that it were going to be good enough for me to make it worth it to come and play whatever I had to play. So at that point, I took everything day by day. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, last year when, when, we, when we were in China, I didn't have a team. I didn't yeah. have a plan for the next year. And I go on and play in China, and then it they call me and ended up in Milan. And it changed my life, you know. I yeah. ended up setting it up in, in, in Italy, and I'm living yeah. there now. Yeah. But I didn't plan it that way. A month before, I had no idea that was going to happen. So, you know, to answer to your question, I don't think I will play anymore. But I am not thinking that way. I'm just going to play the Olympics, and when it's done, it's done, and we'll figure it out then. It's funny, funny how life works, like you said, like you probably a year or two ago, you never thought that you'd be living in Italy and, you know, even at this moment right now, probably, you know, in the Olympics. So that's, that's really cool. Is there, is there something that you're going to miss about the game of basketball, you know, once you step away? I think, I think I will will miss a lot. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually a little bit nervous about it. I, I just like it. You know, I, I, been talking a lot these last five, six, even like seven years about what's next. You know, in the mm-hmm. NBA, they prepare you a lot. What's next? What are you going to do? How are you going to prepare? I think that's something that is very important. You guys are doing it in the in the ELPA. I think that's very important. I'm very happy you guys are doing it. It's very difficult. And when when we're talking to all these people that are trying to help, they're very, very nice. They give yeah. you options, ideas, and you sit and do brainstorming. And he's like, okay, you can be whatever, you know, coach. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can be like, oh, okay, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when, when I play basketball, it's like, yes, you know, yes. it's like, <laughs> that's it. Let's go. <laughs> let's go play in Italy. Let's go. You know, yeah. we play tomorrow. Let's go. It's a different yes. You know, nothing is, you know, nothing is basketball. So I, I feel that it's not going to be easy to me. And then, the fact that you can come into a team at whatever level, you know, because like some people confuse, like when you are at the highest level, but when you are at the lower level, it's not the same. It's the same. The fact that you prepare whatever challenge you have, whatever project you have, you prepare yourself, you empty yourself, you, you know, work very, very hard and you perform. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but that, imposing your will, you know, making something happen or trying to make something happen. I find tremendous pleasure on that. And I don't see anything else but basketball or sports that you can mm-hmm. do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally so I, I'm anticipating it's going to be very difficult for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I would assume, I mean, it's something that you've been doing for all your life or preparing for all your life to do. And then once that, you know, that day stops, it's not, it's not I would think it's never going to be easy to, uh, to find. Um, I was having a conversation with Calderon, um, Jose Calderon, and I was asking him about the same thing. That was one of our topics about retirement. And he said that, you know, one of the things that he did, he had to find a post-retirement hobby. And he said his new thing was uh, cycling. So he was like in the the in, uh, spin class. He said he was doing spin class. So he was like in downtown Manhattan at the lower, you know, spin classes. And that was like his new thing. So what what do you think your post-retirement hobby would be if you had like some type of choice or you had something well you know i always uh, uh i i like flying i like airplanes i became a pilot uh, about five or six years ago mm-hmm. and i always had this this fantasy to, of uh, circling the world for this, for that's awesome. of proper yeah. airplane. so that's something awesome. that's something that i think i will pursue you know it's a little bit challenging but um, but that's something that i will put some time in it uh, we see how far do I get because the war is pretty big and the airport is pretty small. So we see we see how far do I get. But that could be like something that I that I could feel passionate about it. But I do believe that at the same time, 
I need to find something like, you know, some challenge, you know, mm -hmm. hobbies are fun. And I think you, you can take some of your, of your mind and some of your time. But for us, like for a guy like you, for a guy like, like we've been on the trenches for years, yeah. going on, going behind something, chasing, pursuing something every day, you know, with the highest intensity, with the highest pressure. So... To be your hobby, I, I feel like it might not be enough. I had to find a hobby and something to pursue, something to follow, something challenging. Yeah, some challenge, definitely. Now, we we talked about the, the end. Now, I want to, you know, go back to the start and go back to the beginning. You know, so when did you first, you know, fall in love with basketball? You know, what was like, you know, do you remember when, when you, you know, you, you fell in love with the game? And, and how did you start playing the game at, at, such a, at a young age? Yeah, um, I my dad used to play basketball. He was semi-pro in Argentina. It was a different time, of course. We're talking about the mid '80s, mm -hmm. and um, and I, we are three three brothers, two sisters, and myself. Um, and uh, my dad used to take me to the to to the gym when they were practicing. So I was there with him at the practice, and quickly I realized that you know that was kind of like my connection with him. Mm. You know, we get mm -hmm. to talk about basketball. We get mm -hmm. to play basketball. There was something that me and him understand, and we kind of speak like a different language when we were in the table. You know, it was a little bit that it was kind of like a unique connection. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's how I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to play basketball. And then quickly I started being taller, and I started, you know, being playing well, and people start talking about me. Mm -hmm. It happened very fast. It happened very early. At the age of 13, 14, people were already, there was already talk about me, and, and I quickly identified that my dad was very, very proud when I was yeah. playing basketball. You know, I was playing, I was playing well. They were calling me for, for the national team of, you know, under 13, under 14, whatever, and my dad was streaming extremely proud about it yeah. and you know that was a sensation that i enjoyed it and i, and I wanted to pursue it i actually i believe as a fact that to this point this yeah. is this thing still moves me you know when yeah. he sent me a text whatever i did you know it still touches me so i i pretty much believe that, that that's pretty much the reason him is the reason why i play basketball yeah, I mean, it, I, honestly, it was kind of funny hearing your story because it's like it was very similar to me. Like my story was like, you know, growing up, you know, obviously I, I played basketball, I liked basketball, but I started pursuing basketball because my parents got a divorce and my dad loved basketball. So it was like the time I got to spend with my dad was like playing basketball. So like the same, like I identified that like very early. I was like, oh, well, if I'm going to spend time with my dad and play with my like. I'm going to play basketball. So like our time would be like on the court working out or in the weight room or doing stuff like that. So that's it. Yeah, that's cool. Like, I definitely identify and I, I feel very similar to you. It's awesome because like, I'm hearing you and I got, you know, like goosebumps. Yeah. Like, I'm like, this is very cool. And it's happening to me now. Yeah. Like my son, all of my kids, but my son is 15. My other, my second son is 14 and they started playing basketball. And like, you know, some days we practice and we go hard and I'm 41. Yeah. So we finish practice, I'm dead tired. And we go into his practice. So I take him to practice. Practice is over. He's like, that. let's play one-on-one. And I'm like, <laughs> and I know I had to play, you know, I know I had to play. That's my connection with him. Yeah. And I'm like, I can barely move. <laughs> and he's starting to beat me. So I'm like, I had to play hard. But I think it's very cool. That, that connection is awesome. It's probably strategic on his point. He probably wants to play you after practice. So that's when you're tired. Exactly. So when when was the moment that you knew or you felt that you can be a professional basketball player? Well, there, there was a time I was um, I was about 14, 15, and, and there was, you know, how it is. Argentina is pretty much like Europe, you know, like yeah. in terms of like clubs. They've got the, the youth programs, uh, like in Italy, you know, and then they, they you know, they reach players from the area. So at the age of 14, like uh, teams from the, from the league, they were kind of like recruiting me, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, we want him to come to this city, blah, 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 blah. My dad didn't tell me like pretty much 
like 80% of those I wouldn't find out, but then eventually people will talk or they will come straight to me and, and I will hurt that. And I'm like, okay, I think, I, I think I'm going to leave uh, from basketball. I think I'm going to make a living out of this. I wasn't sure to, to what level. And at the age of 15, I went on and, and they called me for the national team for Argentina that it was under 19, like four years mm-hmm. older. And we went to play a, a World Cup of that age on Greece. And right after that, like everything like escalated very quickly. And Vitoria, Vasconia, mm-hmm. uh, Alfredo Salazar, who was the, the GM of, of Vasconia at that time, he started pursuing me. My dad did not want my my dad, my mom and dad, both of them, they did not want me to go there so young. I can so imagine. they hold on uh, for for a, for two years actually. And and Alfredo was say insisting like for those two years non-stop and eventually i signed with them but at that time like about 15 like it was him and there was a couple other guys calling and it was like pretty much a confirmation that those guys were offering me a contract a professional contract so you know it could be more or less i could be better awards but i was going to leave from basketball at that point it was confirmed to me it was very early i was i was 15. I want to talk about the, the the golden generation, as you, you know, as you guys are called. Um, do you remember the first time that you guys started playing together? I think you mentioned it a little bit just before, like the first time you met Manu or the first time you met, you know, uh, Alberto or some of the other guys. And, you know, when you guys kind of realized that you guys built that chemistry, because from my, from my understanding, from what I read is that, you know, you guys all have such a special friendship on, off the court. Um, you guys basically grew up together, and that's the reason why you guys have been so successful and have basically, you know, changed, you know, changed basketball in Argentina forever. Yeah, the, uh, at the time, you know, on the different, we got like a three or four basketball cities, Buenos Aires, Bahia mm-hmm. Blanca, Cordoba, Mar del Plata. Those are like the main cities, Rosario a little bit. So some of those guys, they, they share cities, so they, they've been like pretty much playing Uh forever together like they were from very very young but at the age of 14 15 all those you know you national national mm-hmm. teams they start happening and at that point we cross we, we together we cross but obviously some guys coming later and then yeah. some guys left and they came back but that was the first time that we start like you know getting to know each other and we play uh together that, that, that year 95 there was a bunch of players that he came with the national team in 96. Manu joined the team. Roberto joined the team mm-hmm. in 97. You know, Johnny and uh, Pepe Sanchez was there from before. So we start building that. And the first time I played with Manu, for example, was in 95. And the, mm-hmm. the first time that I played with Pepe Sanchez was also in 95. So about around that time, we were about between uh, 14 and 19. We get to know each other, start playing together as a team. And then we know we finish playing. Some some of us we're still playing today. You know the team is still playing. Yeah. It was there a moment that you you know when you guys came together and you guys kind of became the team that you felt that like that we can be really good. We can be you know really special because up to that point you could correct me if I'm wrong. Argentina basketball had you know I think it was some years before you guys have been you know won even you know even medaled in in some competition. So was there a period or a point where you said like wow like you know we can be we have something special. Yeah, there was a few moments. Like in, in 97, we played uh, under 22 World Cup in Australia. And uh, we we made it all the way to semifinals. And that year, Manu was there, Roberto was there, uh, Pepe Sanchez was there, I was there. You, at that point, we, we can feel it. There, there was like, okay, the, this, this group of guys, we're going to be very good players. We're going to do some good things. We didn't know, we didn't know, like, Seven yeah. years later, we were going to be winning a gold medal. Of course yeah. not, but it felt like we were coming. And and then two years after, uh, a bunch of guys from the big team they they didn't come. They did they they gave up the national team. So we had to play for the big team for the senior team. And we went to Puerto Rico to try to qualify to the Olympics to the 2010 the Olympics. And we lost to Canada by seven. We fell short. Canada has Steve Nash, McCullough, mm-hmm. very good team. And they beat us. And um, but at that point, we were like, okay, this team is good. And three years later, we played the, the World Cup final. You know, we, yeah. we didn't know we were that good. 
but we felt at that point, I feel like 99 is the beginning of it. This is when we were like, we're going to be doing very good things. We don't know, we don't know what, we don't know how far we're going to get, but we know things are about to change, you know, for, for us. And when we get to uh, Indianapolis 2002 World Cup, we, our goal was to get into the fifth, like, you know, quarterfinals and maybe yeah. win a game to be finish fifth, sixth. That was our goal, you know, that was our goal. And we felt like, I mean, we underestimate ourselves. We went all the way to the finals undefeated. We beat the U.S., we beat everybody, and we were up eight with two minutes to go in the final. Mm -hmm. We just underestimate ourselves. We didn't believe we can be that good. And that's what we lost that final. We didn't believe it. We 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 got scared. And then two years later, things changed completely. And we knew yeah. at that point we were good and we didn't underestimate ourselves anymore. And that's when it all happened. Yeah, that's that's what I was gonna ask. But before I go I go there, I was I was I was a fan of Argentina basketball um when I was younger. It was like, you know, the US, US players because because of Pepe Sanchez. He went to Temple University, and I'm mm. from the South Jersey, Philadelphia area. So he was like my first exposure of knowing that basketball existed outside of America. So like when I seen him play, yeah. I was like, wow. And he became like one of my favorite players. And then when I seen, that's when I started following Argentina basketball and everything. Like I, I, like I was like a big fan of you guys like growing up because because of Pepe Sanchez. It was like kind of a small world. And now, like I said, now I'm on a podcast and I played against you. So it's like kind of like like full circle kind of like, you know, for me. So it was like, I was like the kid that was like always watching like your games and people are like, why are you watching Argentina versus Italy? Or why are you watching this versus this? Because everybody, you know, you to only watch the USA games, but I was watching your guys' games at the, the World Cup and stuff like that. So I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool when you mentioned, when you mentioned uh, Pepe's name. Yeah, Pepe is very important for us. I believe Pepe, Pepe was the first one, like at that point, like for us to play in the EuroLeague, for us to play in the NBA, those things were unthinkable. Like, Nobody, nobody from Argentina yeah. do those things. And then he goes on and he's like, no, I don't want any money. I'm going to, to college because I want to, you know, educate myself. And he went on to college and for us, he was like Superman. Like he was playing in national <laughs> TV, you yeah. know, we're watching him in, in ESPN. Yeah. I'm like, what is going on? Like, this guy is doing, like, we're not supposed to do that. Uh -huh. And then he came back and he started lifting weights totally different. And we're like, uh -huh. wow. And, you know, he was the first one that he was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to think bigger. And, you know, to me, Pepe, Pepe, to me, was a big inspiration, too. And to this point, he is my biggest connection in mm -hmm. that generation. Because mm -hmm. the way we talk about basketball, we spend hours talking about basketball, about projects, like how can we do this, how can we do that? And we don't even work together. We just do it for fun. Like Pepe is a big inspiration. I wonder, too, this, this question has occurred to me that, you know, was there ever kind of like, obviously you guys are friends and childhood friends, but was there ever like kind of like like uh, competition amongst each other? Because like I said, you went on to have a a, 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 sol a great <laughs> NBA career. Obviously, Mano is a Hall of Famer. Pepe, you know, went to went to college first. You know, Walter Herman, you know, played with the Pistons. Delfino, you know, the list can go on and on. Alberto, was there like some type of like competition amongst each other? Like, you know, to be like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do that, you know? We had our moments. <laughs> we had yeah. our moments. There was times that, you know, things got difficult. You know, these very, very well. You know, yeah. when you're making a good team, that's because you had good players. There's not yeah. another way to make a good team without good players. Good players, they're good players for a reason. And the second thing, they know they're good players. Like this, you have to believe they're a good player to be a good player first. So the egos are high. Yeah. We know that that's, you know, it's just the way it is. But you and and this is like a big dilemma question. What comes first? Like good chemistry brings yeah. good results, or good results bring good chemistry. I tend to believe that it's the second, you know, we mm -hmm. got our moments, we got these things that they were not so much fun, it wasn't good, blah, 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 but we won. And when we won, we find a way to make it work. And over time, you know, it became this myth that we were perfect. You know, we were all yeah. laughing and talking and yeah. going. And it wasn't like that. I promise you, it was not like that. We had our moments and things were very, very ugly. But over time, we're talking about 17 years ago, you know, yeah. for the for the gold medal. So over time, it kind of like looks like, you know, it was something that it was not. I believe that like results will put you in a better position 
for chemistry. It will help you, and that will create this connection that we have right now. So I want to I want to talk about some some Olympic moments. Um, before we get there, I want to talk about like you talked about the World Cup, um, and you guys, you know, beat the United States, um, you know, in Indianapolis, um, you know. So first, talk about that game, you know, beating the United States, you know, on its home soil. Um, and I, I love the quote from Roberto. He said, you know, we were nobodies and and became rock stars or, or the Rolling Stones, you know, overnight. Um, so, you know, what was that like? You know, what was it like from like the day? Like you said, what was it from going from one day to like you said, you guys were nobodies. And after you beat the United States, he's like, you know, you guys, you know, have I'm sure you guys I'm sure your phone or whatever was you know going crazy at that moment. So so, uh, you know, tell me about that. Tell me about the results and how that happened after the game. I, I I'll tell you a little story about like how old we are. Like there was no phones back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought we I had said, no cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> there was no Twitter. Like the phone, nothing was blowing on. Like it, we had to listen to the people going crazy. There was no Twitter or anything like that. <laughs> there were phones, but they were no roomy. There was like no. There was nothing on the phones. There was no Twitter, no Instagram, none of that. Yeah. But it was crazy because at that at that time, at that point, that, that was you know it was impossible. Like nobody could do that, and um, and we beat them. And and I believe that that kind of like jumpstart whatever happened after. You know, Spain beat them, Serbia beat them, like. Uh, everybody kind of like lose respect and we did it first and and this very crazy thing that happened those two years like that team of Indianapolis it was unbelievable they played yeah. very very good basketball I felt like that was the best basketball we ever played and and we come come short like we lost the final because because of this that we were talking before we didn't really believe we could be yeah. that good so it felt unnatural it's like I, I mean we don't supposed to be doing these things and we ended up losing and two years after, like, uh, we played a lot worse, a lot worse. Like, we actually were in a very, very bad position going, we lost to Italy in the group, we lost to Spain in the group, and we were playing Greece in the quarterfinals at their place with 20,000 people, and they had a very good team with Fotsis and Albertis and a bunch of guys that they were very good players. And and we were down 12 at halftime. Things were going very, very bad. We started fighting each other in the locker room. It was like a very bad situation. And we kind of came back. We start playing. We forget about everything. And we start playing, playing good basketball, solid basketball. We came back. We won that game. And then after that, it was a nonstop. And yeah. it's funny that comparison because like that team was a lot worse than the other team. But when you know how to play the game, when you know how to win, you get to those positions, you get to those points that is up or down, and you find a way to go up, and it changes everything. They came after we played the U.S. and we blow them up, and we play Italy and, and we won by I don't, I don't remember yeah. 14, 15 in final. So we kind of like you know got to that point and made the right call and move up from there, and that was the experience. You know, we believed in ourselves and we knew how we were. And we just make it happen. Two years prior, at that point, we froze and we went down. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of experiences, what was the experience like your first Olympics? You know, the Olympic Village, you know, being around, you know, all the, the top athletes in the world. Um, what do you remember most about that? And, you know, do you have any like kind of funny stories? Like I was talking to Michael Red uh, last week and he was like, yeah, we were we were everybody's eating McDonald's. He was like that. You would think that you have all these high athletes, all these world class athletes, and everybody's just sitting in Olympic Village. You saying ball, this person, that person, they're all sitting there eating McDonald's. And I was like, wow, like I would never think about that. So, you know, it's unbelievable. And I think like that, that you know, that experience at first, like I didn't know much about the Olympics. I mean, I knew they were big, I knew they were important, but I didn't know. I was 24 and I didn't know much about anything. And and then uh, as I played the first time, I was and people were, were going, well, we won, right? That's make it, you know, kind of like a big deal. But everybody yeah. was talking about it, like the whole, like everybody was talking about it. And I was like, okay, like this might be a little bit bigger than I thought. And then <laughs> after that, the next time, I kind of like 
enjoyed it a little bit more. Like it mm-hmm. had to leave the experience. I cannot just play basketball, you know. Mm-hmm. And each one, it was one step forward. Like I enjoy it even more. Like it was to me, it was this very, very, very special. That connection that he was, Michael Ray was describing, is is actually real. Like we sometimes go into the the cafeteria and. Mm-hmm. Roger Federer is right next yeah. to you, or these <laughs> other guys, right? And then, like, random athletes, like, they will come and you will be like, hey, what, what you guys do? Like, we do, you know, 100 meters. Oh, we're like, mm-hmm. you know, you're from whatever, Italy, and you get to talk, or you go into the weight room, and it's just one weight room, and yeah. you don't get to reserve it for you. Like, you have to. So, we go and do squats, and we put it like 80 kilos, and this, <laughs> this little tiny guy puts like, 800 kilos it's like oh my god <laughs> let me get out of here <laughs> you know so all those things i i found it like pretty pretty, pretty unique i remember in the in the um, in the beijing olympics when the same mm. ball was about to become you say involved he wasn't that and yeah. he was right next to us the micah's building was like right next to us and he was like, yeah. there all the time we didn't know, like we were yeah. like bye bye bye, and then one day he was like the most important person in the world, <laughs> and, then, like, and I we never we never saw him again. It was yeah. it was you know the last time we saw him. Like everything ballooned after that. It was impossible, but all those stories. They, they were they were unbelievable, and there was many stories that are not that interesting to the public eye, but to me were unbelievable. Like for example, you you were in the village, and usually this like a lobby, you know, and usually mm-hmm. the whole country is in the same building, and like you watching like I remember one day we were watching a box match, and the whole thing, the, all this, all the athletes from from all the sports were watching the that fight and we were all rooting for this guy and the guy lost and he lost big time and when, mm-hmm. and, and when he arrived to the building he was like all oh, Bruce is like very very sad and, and everybody was there like man what a fight we're proud of you mm-hmm. I mean it's special like for this guy it was special and for us with all those things they happen every day and, and this is pretty much the only place it happened you know you come back from a game and you have like the best any player of the country like waiting for you and telling you, oh my God, what a game, or what a wall, keep going. That's pretty unique. This is the only place it happened. And it happened every day for three weeks and it's just, it's just unique. I can imagine it's a special, special moment, a special event. Um, a special moment that I want to ask you about, um, and I'm sure that, you know, has to be incredible is, is winning the gold medal. I mean, you're very probably less than zero zero point percent of the you know world population that owns or has a gold medal. What was that experience like when you're on the podium with your teammates and you get awarded the gold medal and you hear the Argentine you know national anthem? Like, what type of feeling and emotions were you feeling? And then and then when you guys got back, you know, what was that celebration like in Argentina? It was unbelievable. There was a moment that we were you know in line going to this to the to the male celebration and uh and we, obviously we were in the middle and and we have the u.s on one side and italy on the other side and it felt so real but then we got in and you got into the podium and and you see like the flags the three flags raised up mm-hmm. while the national anthem of argentina is playing and, and i remember us looking at each other like what is, what is going on? Like, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> and the U.S. flag is there. And, you know, for us, it's, it's pretty crazy, you know, because yeah. the, the U.S. flag doesn't supposed to be below, you know, it's supposed yeah. to be on top. Like, we yeah. felt, like, for life, for forever, we felt it was impossible to do that. And to her, our national anthem was, you know, a pretty unique moment that I believe that all the guys that were there at that time is... The, pretty much the highlight of her career. I mean, that doesn't get any better than that. Now I want to fast forward to now. Um, in 2004, you were the youngest on the team, one of the younger players on the team. I guess you could call, you know, you were one of the babies. Now in 2020, you're the senior member, you know, the senior person of the, you know. I am not the younger, <laughs> that's for <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the, you're the, you're, you're the, I like to call the, you're the more experienced guy of the, of the group. Um, you know, so, so what has what has it been like, you know, leading this this next generation 
of, you know, Argentinian players, you know, as they go. I'm, I'm sure this is some of, you know, some guys on the team, first Olympics and, you know, first time experience it. You know, does it revert you back to when you were in 2004? Um, and, and, and what do you, you know, how, do, how does it feel to kind of be, like you said, like the senior member of this team? It feels like really, really well. I enjoy this this position I am right now a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, at the time, like we did all these things in 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 what people call the, the golden generation, and and it was great and a long for a long time for ten years, whatever it was. And at one point in Rio, we didn't have it anymore. I mean, like Manu was forty or thirty nine. Mm-hmm. I was like, like it was getting over. And at that point, like. Uh, the, the mood in the country was pretty much like, okay, it's over. Like, we're not going to yeah. win one basketball game every game. Mm-hmm. And I felt bad about that. I didn't like that. I felt like that was unfair. Like, that was not realistic. I felt like that that's not what it took us there in the first place. So, what, when Coach called me and said, like, I want you back. I want you to come. And I was like, okay, um, I, I'll come back. But I'll come back trying to to replicate what we did, you know, trying mm-hmm. to get back to the same place. Like, obviously, you don't get to do a Manu every 10 years. It's mm-hmm. impossible. You don't get to do a you know, Johnny every 10 years. But, and, and and you don't get to get a gold medal. Like, we only get it once. And yeah. maybe that was it, if whatever. But I wasn't talking about final results. I was talking about a way to go about business, you know, a mm-hmm. way to go about practice, a way, a way to go about, uh, a way to go about the tournament or, or the game or how do we approach day to day, you know, how do we behave? Those things I believe are the biggest value that that generation had. And I think that was what we needed to move, what we need to copy, what we need to carry on to the next generation. So I was like, if you want to do that, and I'm sure you want, I'm in, you know, you can count on me because I feel that that's what we had to do. And the, the, the job, the challenge was to create that. We didn't think about any result. We didn't care about where, how far will we get. We didn't even think about how, what other people would think of because we were coming from a gold medal. So anything will fall short to that. So we couldn't think in that way. We had to think about a project. Like, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to work this way. We're going to behave this way. And we're going to be happy when we achieve that. The result is going to be an accident, and we're going to accept it. And funny enough, ironically enough, we ended up playing the final of the world three years later, yeah. you know, when it didn't supposed to happen that either. So um, I, I find extremely... I feel extremely proud about mm-hmm. this generation and, and I am enjoying it a lot. Now, this quite possibly could be your last Olympics. And I say that because nothing's impossible, man. You may come back another three, four years. Who knows? You know, <laughs> who knows? But this quite could possibly be <laughs> your last Olympics. Is there something that you're looking forward to the most? Is there something like, you know, that I want to experience this? I want to go to this. I want to go to a fencing, you know, event. I want to go something. Just something that you're looking forward to and being that this may be your last. This is going to be a tricky time because of COVID. You know, I think yeah. like there, there were even us, the email us all these protocols that we got to have to follow is going to be not fun, you know. So yeah. it's going to kind of like ruin the Olympic, you know, vibe. But I want to enjoy as much as I can. I want to, you know, be everywhere, watch watch sports, talk to people. I want to be in the cafeteria. I want to go out with the guys. And, mm-hmm. you know, this, you know, like, I'm sure, like, you feel related with this. But when you are around young players, it's funny. Like, they rejuvenate you. Like, we go yeah. to dinner and they talk Absolutely. about this thing, listen to this music. <laughs> yeah. I feel younger, you know, my wife. Yeah you know, laugh at me because I come back and I put this music and she's like, what, what is going on? Like, exactly. what, are you, yeah. like, are, you? what are you listening to? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, these guys, they talk in a way, they move, they move in a way that, you know, they make you feel younger and, and I, I love that. So, I want to, you know, wrap that as much as I can. I want to be around, you know, I want to just Obviously, COVID is not going to allow many of those things, but I just want to try as much as I can because I know how valuable, valuable the experience is, and I just don't want to. I want to make it count. 
what advice are, are you giving to the new generation of players? And, and how does it feel to, you know, hearing that the next generation, the, the Fakus or the Vidozas are, are, are influenced by and inspired by the, the golden generation and the foundation that you guys have laid? I believe that, you know, what I tell them is, is you, you just got to, you know, there's a way you go about business, you know, you work in a way, you, you, you know, you take care of your body in a way, you rest in a way, you behave in a way, like you respect your coach, your teammates, you respect the game, the fans in a particular way. And that's, that's the key, you know, that's, that's what it is all about. Like when you do those things, the result you know, it's just an accident. It will happen. I mean, some players, they got more talented and they're going to get farther. Some players, they got a little bit less talent and they're going to get fell short mm-hmm. or a little bit shorter to the other guys. But you, when you do, do those things, when you work in a particular way, behave in that particular way and do go about business the right way, you guarantee yourself that you're going to reach your ceiling. And when you reach your ceiling, you already won. The result, we don't care. Like, you already won. And to me, like, when I approach all these things that I was doing at the end of my career, some of the things that I'm doing now are a lot less than some other things that I was doing before. Mm-hmm. But to me, the result is not important. What I, The way I do it is, like, I want to work very, very hard. I want to be very, very prepared. I want to approach the game the right way. I want to approach the team the right way. And I want to be able to leave it all on the court, to continue to work and continue to get better all the way until the last game I play. Mm -hmm. And that day in the morning, in the short run, I want to be able to do my, you know, fundamental technique that I do every game for the last 20 years. And at that point, when the last practice is over, that's it, I won, you know, that's, that's when I win or lose. Not the game, it will happen. You know, yeah. I will play, I might play well, I might play bad. It's not totally on your control. But up until that point, until the last practice, is what you can control. And if I was able to get better until the very last day and to leave it all on the court until the very, very last day, that's it. I won, and that's all I want for my career. That's all I want for my last for my, for, for my last time of my career. I love that, man. I love that. Love that mentality. Now we're going to get into the the second part of the podcast. Um, you know, for people that have been watching, in the first part we usually talk about basketball, and like I said, we can go on multiple podcasts of talking about your career and different stories and different things you've been through. Um, but I want to talk about some other things that you were involved in off the basketball court. Um, I've talked to all the guys in Milan and they've told me that, you know, that you're, um, you know, one of the best businessmen or one of the best, you know, investors that they know. Um, funny story. I was, I was uh, at my, my wife has a, a, a ranch or I guess you could say a farm here. Um, and they were, they were herding cattle and stuff like that. And I, I, I re- always revert back to, they were like, Oh, Luis has a cattle. They were telling me that you do cat, you do the cattle business in, in Argentina. Um, but, um, I want to talk more importantly about, um, the new technologies. Um, you know, you're always been intrigued by new technologies and obviously one of the ones that are very popular right now is the cryptocurrency and, and crypto digital collectibles and, and NFT. So. From what I heard is that, you know, you you uh, you co-founded or started a, a, a NFT startup company. So first of all, can you explain, you know, I guess you could say in simple terms, you know, what an NFT is to, you know, to our listeners, to our viewers and, you know, what made you want to get involved or invested in NFTs and, and what is your overall goal with your with your startup with your startup company? Well, you know, uh, it's very hard to, to easily explain NFT. Like people <laughs> struggle. I struggled a lot yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, what, is, what are we talking about? But I guess like uh, an easier way to explain that is like, well, obviously NFT is non-fungible token. And uh, what it is, is like, uh, it's a way to authentify something uh, digital in a way that is uh, unbreakable. Like you cannot, you cannot change that, it's, you know, um, it's completely authentic and it, and it will continue for life. Like nobody can change it. Only the owner of that NFT can change that. Uh, it goes with uh, what they call smart contract that are embedded inside whatever mm-hmm. property we're talking about. It could be uh, it could be a picture, it could be a video, it could be a game, it could be a song, it could be like pretty much anything digital could be 
become an NFT. Um, you can also understand that there's many different uses of an NFT, but you can also understand it as a modern autograph, you know, like a, a picture of you dunking or a blog that you make on the play of that it was very amazing. Mm -hmm. The picture is that picture anybody could have, but that picture with, for example, something that you say or something that you do, you know, becomes authentic because of the picture autographed by you and increase the value of, of that collectible piece. Um, so there's many different use for NFTs. It's very, very big. And we, we initially we started a company in which we were providing uh, consulting and advisory to different companies that mm -hmm. they were that they thought that we could help them, you know, basketball companies, sports companies that were related with that. They thought that maybe uh, we could help them. So we will provide uh, advice in exchange of equity of the company or exchange of whatever uh, product they do. And this guy came in and they said, we got this company that we, got, we do NFTs. And we want you to provide advisory and networking, mm -hmm. and we're going to give you a piece of the company in exchange. Not and bad. I was like, what is an NFT? <laughs> 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 I had no idea what it was. So they explained me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's do it. Why not? Yeah. And then this guy has problems and left. Mm -hmm. And the company became empty. And me and my partner, we were like, okay, this is getting so big that we cannot leave it, that we're going to continue. So we continue with the company, and that's what we're doing right now. It's obviously, I am not full-time, but um, I I expect to be more involved as I leave, uh, as I stop playing basketball. Um, and, and it's going well for us right now. Obviously, it's a kind of like unique situation because yeah. everything is in a big bubble. But it's growing, it's going, it's getting big, and it's a very interesting concept. And I do believe that it has some very interesting uses that uh, that, are, that are going to be very, you know, they're going to be a game changer for pretty much everybody in the industry. Now, just like the the NBA, um, which is, I mean, I think that was probably the first athletic, um, or I guess you could say, sports brand that kind of you know started with the NFTs with their Top Shot. Um, Alpha has recently you know, joined in the NFT market, you know, with the partnership with the with the players. Um, and they started, you know, this collectibles called hypes, you know, showing different final fours, uh, you know, different highlights, like you said, extraordinary block of, you know, myself, or even last year when you were playing, um, you know, so what do you think about the project? And then also, you know, in what ways do you think athletes can benefit or can, you know, use NFTs to, to, to their benefit? And, um, I think that, uh, I mean, you know, like if we talk about this in a year, like the answer probably will be different. Like this will, you know, catch its own life. It's going to mm -hmm. continuously, continuously evolve into something that we don't know. But I think there's many, many uses. I think it's very, very important. Like the question is like, what is going to happen in the future? Like we are yeah. going to do NFT. Everybody's going to do NFT. Some way, some form, some shape is going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be those collectibles that Elpa is doing. We don't know if it's top shot. We don't know if it's going to be, you know, digital art. That is to be discovered yet, but it's going to be the technology behind it is what is good. You know, the technology mm -hmm. behind it is what it allows many, many other things that we are not able to do now. So when when somebody asked me about it from, from the EuroLeague, I was like, you have to do it because yeah. you got to get in. Like, you don't know how is it going to evolve, but you had to get in because uh, there is not a question if you're going to be doing it in the future or not. Uh, so the sooner you get in, the better you can start figuring out all those things. In the case of players, this is a disruptive change. This is a disruptive technology. So it's going to change thing, things for everybody. And I believe that for you league players, it's a very, very good opportunity to start changing things because some things they need to be better for us in terms of like, um, you know, revenue, how do we Definitely. do business? How do we do, you know, appearances? All those things. When you look at the NBA, which is pretty much, the, you know, the blueprint, which is pretty much the example for the whole basketball world, they do other things that we are not quite able to do. 
-hmm. in terms of player rights, players' benefits, players, you know, commodities, all those things that we had to find a way to move in that direction. And all this, you know, something like this come and shakes everything. Okay, this is a great opportunity. That's how you start, you know, like, okay, we're going to do this, but we're going to start doing it the right way. We're going to start doing it in a way that we feel more comfortable with. I mean, there's one thing in basketball that it cannot lack is players. Like, you can play yeah. with our coaches, you can play with our fans, you can play with our refs, you can play with our, like, the one, the one thing, yeah. you know, that you cannot, you know, Be miss player. is the players. <laughs> yeah. So, we, you had to find a way to value that, and the NBA is the you know the example. We had to go behind that. We had to chase that, chase that, and I think NFT is a good opportunity for that because it's a disruptive technology. So it's very hard to know how the future of NFT in in basketball is going to be, but it's going to be something. So we had to explore the other thing, you know, because it's a big bubble. You know, we have so many questions about it. There has to be a way in which you don't increase your risk. Like this should not cost money for the players. Yeah. This should not cost any money for the players because that's when you increase the risk and that's when you can get in trouble. That could become a very bad thing. So whatever else the players can explore, you know, whatever else ideas that anybody could put on the table. I feel those are all welcome as long as they're not then you don't have to put any money or like those are in a, a structure that feels comfortable with the players. Like the players are moving up in the scale, you know, they're getting more important in the revenue share. Absolutely. I, I, mean, I definitely agree with, with everything you said. Now, if I'm a young player or if I'm a player that wants to, you know, learn more about NFTs, how would you suggest, like you said, you know, a few months ago, many like many of us, nobody knew about NFTs. Nobody really knew, and still, we're still learning about more about NFTs as we go today. But if I want to learn more about NFTs and, and what they are, um, you know, where do you think I, I I should start? You know, where 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 do you think? Where would you you know? What would be the first thing you would tell me I should do to learn? And then also, um, at the same token, if I want to get involved in NFTs, um, I, I was right now we have Top Shot, we have you know hypes with with Euro League, um, and Elpa. But, you know, if I want to get involved in NFTs, where do you suggest I would start? Well, for the, the, the answer would be different if it's like a regular person or if it's like an yeah. athlete, like in your case or, or a young player is different. If you want to get involved in NFT, you really, really have to use it. That, that's, mm -hmm. your, that's your car to enter. You have to find a way to do something with what you can bring to the table, you know? whatever that is but it's something that you produce because because of your your you know your brand you know you you being a player if you don't have that and if you don't have that exposure you the only way you, it is going to be you had to pay some money and that will increase mm -hmm. risk for us athletes there's always somebody that wants whatever we're doing on the court you know there's always some content that has value there's all, always some collectible pieces that we are involved those are the things that we had to pursue. So if you want to get involved, you can get involved individually or as an organization like Kelpa or Yearly. Both of them are fine, but you have to find to use your value, you know, instead of like bringing money, you know, like you had to use your value, find a way to, to do it with your value. That's a big, to me, the biggest advice. And the, I mean, to learn about NFT is like very, very difficult because it's so new that it's yeah. not literal, literal about it. Like it's very hard to find things yeah. to read. So this, this, whatever you know, phone you use or whatever platform you use, for example, Google. Like if you start googling NFTs, you will have a bunch of art, uh, uh, articles, and then the algorithm will, you know, start throwing you news yeah. about that. And that's pretty much what I do, you know, like I get up in the morning and I got like 10 different news and, I, and the ones that I feel that are interesting, I read them. I do two, mm -hmm. two or three articles every morning and I move on. The next day, something new happened and those, those pop up into your, into your, your fed. And I think that's a pretty cool way to this, this actually some other sites that they have a bunch of information, mm -hmm. but this is like kind of like a everyday thing because there's something new every day. 
So yeah. you cannot just like do a NFT course, you know, you cannot go to NFT school. Like you yeah. have to read a little bit today. And then tomorrow you have to read a, read, read a little bit about whatever new happened tomorrow. And it's kind of like that, you know, like every day is it's a different type of education. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to let you go now. I appreciate you, um, you know, taking the time, you know, out of your, your busy schedule. Obviously, you know, you're, you're training and you're getting ready for the Olympics, you know, with your, with your national team. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, as I said before, man, it's always big respect and a big honor. I can say you've been an inspiration, you know, to me from afar. Um, and it's great, you know, playing against you this past year and, and even now, you know, having this conversation with you um, and getting to know you more, getting to know you more. So I definitely appreciate you. Definitely appreciate you taking the time and uh, best of luck. Um, in the upcoming of upcoming Olympics. Thank you very much, guy. It was a lot of fun. You know, thank, yeah. thanks a lot for all the kind words, and it, w it was a lot of fun. You know, you yeah. got a good podcast. I hope it was well this time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll continue to talk very soon.